Good day and welcome back to the 4040 podcast with your host as usual, Mr. Thomas Henley. Today it's it's been a bit of a slow day for me. I'm currently being through a little bit of a low mental health period this this past month or so. So I'm I'm really trying at the moment to work on myself, try to get all my my diet and my exercise right, um, get in touch with the GP. Uh, it tends to be if if you is if you, if it's your first time tuning in, it tends to be with me that I have at least a few months during the year where I dip into severe in terms of depression. So it's it's been a bit rough, but um, things are going well. And I, I'm I'm starting to see some positive changes in my my mental state. So things are doing good. Today I've got a very interesting episode for you. We're going to be talking about autism and asexuality. And if you have been a regular listener of the podcast, you'll know that I did a episode with Yo Samdi Sam in um, my past season where we talked about demisexuality. Uh, but now we're going to bring it a little bit more out of focus, get a bit more, a bit more of an understanding of what what the A spectrum is, and also about what it's like to to live um, as an asexual. So I'm joined by my very lovely guest, PJ AU, PJ or I, I can't remember. AU, PJ, you had AU, it right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How about you? Not too bad. It's not too bad. Just getting into the flow of the week. It's about Tuesday today, so mm-hmm. not not yet to the middle of the week. So we've got we've got a way to go. But um, we've we've done quite a few um, posts on Instagram, didn't we? Because I I linked up with you. I don't know. I think about a few months ago when we were sort of chatting about because I saw your modelling pictures and I was like, oh my god, an autistic model and they're asexual. That's, um, you know, I, uh, in my head, I was like, right, we could definitely do a podcast together on this, but Mm -hmm. we also did like a few blogs, didn't we? um... Yeah, no. And you did a wonderful job with those infographics (laughs) and we make such a good team because I don't know another autistic asexual model. So it's really Mm -hmm. cool that we were able to get together and make those. Yeah, definitely. And I think one thing to clarify to everybody is that I'm not asexual in the, the, the sense of what you may be thinking. I'm I'm part of a subset of a of asexuality, which is demisexual. Um, I'm sure we'll be able to go into all the the details on that very very soon. Yeah, I should have said a spec is the yeah, proper the term A-spec. for that. So, <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> no worries, no worries. So, I guess what would be really great to talk to you about first is about your modeling. How did you get into modeling? And why do you think you you gravitated towards it? Yeah, it's a good question that I actually get asked a lot. So I came prepared for this answer. Um, <laughs> um, really, it was by total accident. I have always modeled throughout my life, doing small photo shoots for like family pictures and sometimes for like bigger things. Mm-hmm. But then after I graduated high school, I really wanted to be an actress and I, I'd always wanted to be one just to see what it was like. And I signed with a local agency. I somehow got hired to do a really cool Hollywood movie, which is one of the film industries in India. And Mm. I did that movie and I really loved being a part of it. But the stressful thing was staying in front of a camera for like eight to 10 Mm. hours a day, saying the same lines over and over again. And for those that don't know me, I have apraxia of speech and i also yes, have yeah. selective mutism so i guess the term they're going for now is involuntary mutism but it was mm. really hard for me to like speak in front of a large group even though i already knew what i was going to say and it was very stressful yeah. it was very draining and I, I imagine that it's not only you're not only just talking to a camera like i do with my youtube videos you have people around you and they're all like coordinated in a way to to get a certain take and so the, uh, the pressure that you must feel like doing one of those things, I, I, I can't, can't imagine. 
Yeah, it was definitely super stressful. And I talked to my agent about it. I said, I don't know if I can do this after all. And then he kind of encouraged me to step into modeling because it was a way to build your portfolio, but also keep up the resume that you currently had and say you were doing stuff still. So I entered a thing in the industry called TFP, or it stands for time slash trade for print. So basically mm. you're going out and working with local photographers and in exchange for, you know, both of your times, you get maybe two to eight different images from the shoot back. Sometimes they'll let the models choose. Sometimes they'll choose them themselves, or sometimes it will be a collaborative effort, but sure. sometimes makeup artists can be involved as well. And they get to choose photos too. And it's really nice because I like most of the time I'm not disappointed. I love all the sh photos that I get back from the shoot and I can post them on Instagram and I have a portfolio for potential casting agents to go to and see my work. But at yeah. the same time, it was much easier on my disabilities. Obviously you don't have to talk for modeling, which was very nice. And the more that you do it, the more experience that you gain from it in general. So it really builds up your confidence. And also for me personally is much easier on my disabilities. Mm. I've heard, I've heard a lot about um because I, I talked to a guy called uh, Reggie in my first season, and he's he's an autistic actor, and he was telling me about um trying to go for autistic characters in in like a movie or a TV series or a show, and it if if you've seen him, he is like the the spitting image of like Hollywood, um looks like attractiveness and like he's really really bonny guy if you can say that and he he cannot get any autistic roles at all because of the way he looks like they want someone who's short they want someone who's white and male want someone with glasses and it looks a bit nerdy mm -hmm. um bit of a skinnier frame and i suppose like so it's really depressing that isn't it because we're always talking about trying to get representation in movies and TV series, but they're intentionally using the stereotypical lens of what they think autism looks like to find people to play those roles. <laughs> yeah. And well, I think the good news is we're finally getting the attention that we deserve because I happen to audition for, I don't know if you've heard of the show, everything's going to be okay. But there's mm, an autistic actress that, yeah, there's an autistic actress that plays an autistic character. And I also had the wonderful opportunity to also audition for that role. And even though I didn't get it, it still went to another autistic actress. And I was very happy about that. And Good. actually the same thing for asexuality too. I'm sure if, if you're in the aspect community, you've heard of Bojack Horseman and there's an asexual character on the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Todd. Todd. And later <laughs> on in the season, spoiler alert, in the sixth season to be exact he meets an asexual rabbit and they end up getting mm. together and yeah, they yeah. were also looking for an asexual actress for that character and i was in the running along with echo gillette and it ended up going to echo gillette and but this time it was because i was too far away and i was like so close but the fact that <laughs> i got God. noticed by the bojack, bojack uh, horseman as well yeah Oh would God. have been crazy, but I, I do agree that Echo Gillette portrayed her very well and still a sexual representation. So that's what makes me happy the most is that we're we're slowly building it up. It is taking a lot of time, but we're we're getting there for sure. Yeah, that's really great to hear. Like I've I've only really he heard uh, negative things. So it's good to to hear that there is some representation coming through. and. Uh, just, just thinking, thinking of Bojack Horseman. He's like <laughs> that show is has been such a such a massive interest of mine for a long time. Typically, because the main character is like a massive existentialist, and he goes through like different crises and stuff. So, I relate to that a lot in the ways. There's a lot of ways that I don't relate to him. <laughs> I could definitely say that for sure. Yeah, but um. No, I thought it's it's a really great show, isn't it? It's not it doesn't pull any punches. Um uh, definitely. Yeah. And they they do a really great job of not just showing that there's an asexual character, especially a man, because you don't see that often in media mm -hmm. as well. It's mostly asexual yeah. women. So we had male representation, 
And you also saw that he was a romantic asexual. So they mm-hmm. were talking about how some asexuals are still in relationships. Some asexuals yeah. are not. So I overall, I think it's one of the best representations we've had so far, for sure. Wow. Hopefully get we get more. Yes, that would be nice. <laughs> Preferably not in cartoon form as well. Yes, that is also very true. <laughs> so, um, you know, as far as like the, the autism and... and and asexuality i mean have you have you been gravitating towards jobs that allow you to to talk about it or to to sort of represent it or do it as part of like a an overarching movement is there anything that you've been involved in that's like specific to autism or asexuality um in terms of asexuality not necessarily because you know, I kind of speak about it on my own terms. If it comes up, then that's when I'll speak about it. And that's solely because like, I'm not actively looking to advocate for the asexual community. It's just kind of sure. something that ended up happening, which is still mm-hmm. great. I love talking about it. It's just, there's times where I can't talk about it. I'm mostly known as an autistic advocate and I'm actually partnered with a couple local organizations and helping them out with not just representation, but helping other autistic adults find the services and accommodations that they need. So I think that's more of my platform is I tend to focus on autism, but if there's an opportunity where I can speak up about asexuality and especially the intersections between being autistic or neurodivergent and being on the LGBT plus Mm -hmm. spectrum as well, then of course I'm going to take that opportunity. So, so this this podcast is uh, ticking the boxes. Then, <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> I had to hop right on it. Yeah, that's really great that you're doing you're doing work in your local community as well. Because I think, you know, quite often when we're faced with this online world of social media and stuff, we can get a bit bogged down in, you know, like who's who's list, who's listening to 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 the awareness and acceptance work that I'm doing, rather than volunteering for places you know teaching like going out there and doing some some active work i think it's really really important especially if we're wanting to change things like systemically like in businesses and schools and so i really admire that you you do that kind of work as well thank you i appreciate that so um i guess you know to sort of start us off talking about asexuality i mean what what is it and could you sort of explain to us what the ace spectrum is yeah so for those of you that have not heard of asexuality it's basically the lack or complete absence of sexual attraction and it can get kind of confusing because as thomas mentioned there are sub identities of asexuality mm-hmm. including demisexuality and gray sexuality but it's just like the autism spectrum. It is very diverse. It is very broad and anyone can range in experiences from, you know, still being a sex positive ace. So they're still, you know, having intercourse with people. And then you have people like myself and my husband who are sex repulsed. We don't want anything to do with it. (laughs) Um, So there's just a really wide variety of aces and it's, it's hard to put it in a, a general thing because Again, it's very diverse and everyone's going to have a different experience with it. But the main definition is the lack or absence of sexual attraction. Sure. Uh, I know we're going to talk about it a le- little bit further on, but there's also something key that you talked about is like the romantic element of it as well. Like you've got, um, I'm right in thinking you've got the the asexual part, which is to do with intimacy like that. And then the, if you're a romantic, it means that you don't want a partner. You don't want a romantic relationship with somebody. Precisely. And well, basically it means that there's no romantic attraction. There are sure. queer platonic relationships that are often talked about in the community that I'm not that familiar with because I, I'm not a romantic. So I'm still kind of learning about that. Mm-hmm. There's some people that are a romantic, but still want some sort of partnership or friendship So those couples do exist as well, um, which I think is what the queer platonic relationship is. Correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. But yes, many, I think, I want to say over half of aromantics are just completely fine being alone. 
But then you also have aromantics who might still be allosexual, which is just a fancy word for saying that they still experience sexual attraction. So mm. like just like asexuality, aromanticism is a very broad spectrum and everyone's going to have a different experience with it as well. Sure. There was uh, two terms that you mentioned, um, allosexual and gray sexual. Um, I'm not 100% on either of them. Would you be able to explain them a bit more? Of course. So gray sexuality is a person who is between being allosexual and being asexual. So they're, they're it's kind of like a gray area is really what okay. it's named after. Yeah. So they're not really sure where they lie on the aspect or the asexual spectrum, I should say. And then allosexual is just, again, a fancy term for someone who still experiences sexual attraction so they can be heterosexual, homosexual, pansexual, mm -hmm. just basically someone who is, I guess, quote, normal. But that's not the term that we go for because <laughs> nothing is normal anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of like the, the op is it, would it be like the opposite of asexual? If you're allosexual, then you want intimacy. Yes. If you're asexual, okay. You would be sexually straight, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that. That clears it up. I was a little <laughs> bit unsure about the aloe bit. I was like, it's a weird term for sure. So I don't blame you. It's like it's like with autism, like um, we say uh, like neurotypical or holistic instead of exactly. It's like holistic, kind of, except mm. in the sexual form. Sure, sure. Well, that's really interesting. I get. I guess the natural sort of question after that, which you know, it's we're on an autism podcast i mean is there any any sort of link between autism and asexuality i definitely think there's some correlation i know for me personally i do have a lot of sensory issues especially surrounding intimacy so yeah. i think that's why there are so many uh, autistic people who identify as asexual. And I can't remember where I saw the statistic, but I think over 50% of autistic people are somewhere on the asexual spectrum, whether it be demisexual, gray sexual, asexual. And then of course, mm. in general, you have more autistic people who identify as LGBT plus. And I think sure. that number is well over 70% of autistic people are a different sexuality, a different gender, and there's there's definitely some correlation there as well. So it doesn't surprise me that there are a lot of autistic people who openly identify as asexual. In fact, I know a lot of autistic people who are asexual. I have many friends who are both autistic and asexual. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I know, I know, I I really relate to the uh, the whole thing about sort of the the sensory aspects to it because. You know, I, I, I'm not, a, I'm not fully asexual, so I, I understand that there's, I understand the issues that, that commonly come up, like, uh, the, the light touch and certain, um, issues perhaps around, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I want to go into it fully. There's a lot no of pressure. stuff century rise <laughs> to do with that, that whole thing. And, um. I think as well, as well as the sensory stuff, there's also the the elements of indirect communication because very true. A lot of people uh, they, they they don't tend to be very vocal about what they want and what they don't like, and I think that can be very very difficult for us because you kind of have to you have to try and read this situation, and we're naturally not very good at doing that unless we've we've practiced mm -hmm. and i think that can definitely be a really big issue and um there was this guy that I was talking about who was interviewing me for a, for his book oh very which cool just kind of around empathy and alexithymia and stuff like that and he was mentioning that you know there seems to be some kind of link between like more atypical sexual relationships and autism like things around you know strict strict rules around being dominant and submissive and like having a list of what you can and can't do and what that kind of thing 
So I think some sometimes stuff like that can be really, really, really helpful. Mm-hmm. But obviously, not divulging from the topic too much. I imagine that, you know, if autistic people, we tend to be very, um, indep- we tend to be quite independent thinkers, I would say. Like, we, yeah. we follow what we think makes sense and not necessarily what most people think. So things things like social norms kind of, especially for me, if I was speaking for my for myself, you know, social norms, they kind of, they, they just didn't hold any relevance to me. Like a lot of them, they make sense, like things around eating and things around, some things around socializing, but there's other stuff that really just doesn't make any sense. And, you know, as aspects to that, like how you live your relationship, how you live your dating life, you know, what, why do you have to fit a mold that everybody's telling you to fill when it's not something that satisfies your needs and can sometimes even be quite harmful for you? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. I think it's, um, I don't know, do you think there's a, there's any other aspects to being autistic that might kind of make us more inclined to, to being, being on the asexual spectrum? You know, it's a good question that unfortunately I don't think I have the answer to. It's, <laughs> it's just <okay. laughs> some things it's like you, it's like why people try to figure out why someone's gay or why someone's a different mm. orientation. And sometimes you can have your theories, but you don't actually know. And that's, I guess it's just the way it is. I think that's, that's a, that's a great response. <laughs> oh, good. I was I didn't, I wasn't sure if I was making no, sense no. or not. <laughs> no, it makes sense. Like, I don't, I, you know, and t- to be honest, I don't think people should need to, to justify themselves. Like, you know, it's their, um, it's their own private lives and they can, you know, it doesn't affect anybody else if, if you know, especially, especially around asexuality. So, you know, I don't, I don't think a lot of the, the hate and a lot of the negativity that's projected towards the asexual communities, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like what, 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 what's, what's the problem? What's happening? <laughs> like, yeah. Why are you so angry that we're not <laughs> in a sexual relationship it's like my husband put it because you know we get hate all the time and yeah. someone you know and this happens a lot in the a spec uh i keep saying that it's the asexual spectrum a lot of people in the ace community they get asked well if you, how do you know you don't like sex if you've never tried it and my husband came up with this response and he said well you don't need to leave a gallon of milk out in the sun for two weeks straight and then drink it to know that it's not going to taste good and that's going to be mm. bad for you so I suppose another good example would be, well, how do you know that you're not gay or bisexual, and unless you you go out and do yeah. stuff with, it, with another man or another yeah, woman? Yeah, why are we getting asked this? Like, <laughs> <laughs> or, or or perhaps going asexual and uh, and just not having any of it. So, how do you know that you don't like that? <laughs> yeah, well, and I think it's because a lot of people confuse it and they think that asexuality means that you don't like sex. But of course, yeah. that's not true at all. There's a lot of asexual people who love sex. It's just they don't experience the attraction that comes with it. So mm. sometimes asexuals have sex with their partners just to, you know, satisfy them. And then sure. you have people who actually do like it. It's just they don't experience the attraction to that person. And that mm. they just get straight to the act, and you know, I mean, I don't know, I'm not that person, but I, that's no, from no. what I understand. I think there's there's a word for that, isn't there? I remember I went on to Hannah Witten's "Doing It" podcast, and she was mentioning about sort of like profiles, and there's a, there's a name for for having no like, I can't remember it. No. Oh. I'm gonna have to start. I'm gonna have to search it. I think I know what you're talking about too, and it's frustrating me that I don't know it either. It's probably right off the top of my head. Yeah. Oh, it's just come up with stuff on demisexuality. I don't need that. Hmm. Is it like uh, sex adverse or something? No, it's it's like just just liking the actual physical pleasure and not actually having any 
emotional connection with it. There's there's some word for it, but I don't think it. Yeah, I know there's a much. lot more sub identities that we tend to only use in the community. Of course, for sex repulsed asexual is the word I think is apothesexual. And then mm. you have people who I can't remember. I can't remember the definition, but I know that another term is like a coy sexual, or I don't know how to pronounce it, but that's another one. There's like a bunch of sub identities for the entire community. And we tend to only use them in the asexual community because yeah. if we use them outside of the community, it's going to confuse people even more, but there's like a term for everything in our community, which is great. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. I mean, one, one of the, one of the issues that, that I have particularly about the autistic community is that people, I, I don't, I still don't think people know a lot about autism. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, we still do need a lot of acceptance and awareness work for people. And I, I find it, I mean, someone myself, sometimes I find it hard to, to understand all the language and the sub subcategories and like, I, I can't imagine how, how much of a barrier to entry that could be for somebody mm -hmm. like you're having to understand all of this different language to understand what someone's talking about, which I think, uh, you know, that's, it's probably, probably a good thing. Cause I, I imagine that awareness and acceptance work is, is just, just as hard, if not harder than the yeah. autism stuff. I mean, gosh, I'm still learning new things about both communities every single day. There's like a term yeah. I've never heard of or another perspective that gets brought up. And I go, oh, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> I've never heard of that before. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting, the, evol the evolving of language, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's just it seems to be very heavily uh, policed in the autistic community, which is which can be really hard for someone, even even if they're autistic people trying to to get into the community and do do some awareness and acceptance work if they don't have a full idea of of exactly what language is okay and not okay they they will every single time they'll get bashed for it they'll you know they'll i mean it, it happens quite a lot a lot of people particularly one That's, friend yeah. that i know called called Brian Bird um, he runs the autism support community Instagram. He posts a lot of memes and stuff nowadays. Uh, he's a really great sort of speaker. Mm -hmm. And he had that issue coming into the autistic community. You know, getting a lot of hate online for using terms like Asperger's, uh, high functioning, functioning labels, stuff like that. And it really makes me sad sometimes because it's like, you know, he's obviously coming in here for for the same reasons that everybody else is, is is just not using the language. Yeah. I think that barrier into barrier to entry is, is always a really, really tough hurdle to overcome when it comes to autism. Yeah, I definitely had that experience when I found the actually autistic community as well. <laughs> and I wish people that's why I try to be like very gentle with my answers and kind of explain yeah. Oh, hey, well, the term that you're using is actually a term that we don't use anymore. Or I try to sure. be very gentle about it. And most of the time it works. But then you have those people who are very like, no, this is I want. And that's fine. You, you have to leave it <laughs> at that. I think I know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and Wait, so, Was it perhaps on one of the posts that we made? Um, could have been. Actually, no. But that person, too. You just have yeah. to be very gentle and patient because you really don't know if they're actually if they know about it or not like you have to go mm. in assuming that they don't know that whatever term is bad or that mm. they don't understand something so if you just got to try and say well this is what it actually is and not just you're using the wrong term no stop you're like yeah you're automatically a bad person we're gonna push you to the side you, yeah you're cancelled you you're removed mm -hmm. i understand yeah. that the key is patience as i've learned it's also it's also really hard with with online stuff anyway because text is not a flawless way of communicating well it's 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 pretty suboptimal at communicating emotions and how you're saying things exactly unless you use emojis yeah which that's a lot very of people true. don't mm -hmm. and um i think sometimes it can be hard specifically for me from from what i found to to know how someone's what someone's saying 
are they saying it in an, an annoying, aggressive way, or are they saying it just just plainly, or are they saying it in a nice way? I have no idea. And I'm your stereotypical autistic where it's like jokes and sarcasm just go over my head and I yeah. I never catch it and I have to apologize every time. And it's very awkward and very embarrassing, even in real life with my husband. He's neurotypical. So I have an, and he knows this. He knows that sarcasm and jokes go over my head, but he does it anyway just to mess with me. And I'm like, <laughs> my dad's so, yeah, the same. My online dad's the same. is just, yeah, exactly. Online is not very helpful with determining that at all. And that's why my husband and I came up with a system when we were long distance to use certain emojis when we were being sarcastic. Mm. So like we'd use a blue diamond for like a joke and then like a triangle for like a rhetorical question or something. It was just yeah. very nice, but you it's have, definitely you have stuff like, like tone indicators and things like that, I, but they're not very well known about. I, I didn't was... know about it. No. Well, it's, it's, I, I think it's difficult and I, I'm always trying to find ways to clarify exactly how I'm saying things. Mm-hmm. And most most of the time I'm saying stuff with a smiley face and I'm just, you know, so I, I put a smiley face or I put like a yay or like, <laughs> and um, I think that really helps with me communicating mm-hmm. how I'm saying things. But not everybody does it back and that's where the the issues coming out. And I think nowadays I, I'm probably more comfortable having a phone conversation than, than texting. Cause it's like, you know, at least I can sort of somewhat understand how they're saying things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if, they're, if they're being aggressive or they're being annoyed or, you know, mm-hmm. that used to be me too. But unfortunately like my tinnitus, especially with telecommunications has gotten really bad and oh, like, dear. this is fine because, you know, I'm able to read your lips and I'm able to see like the context of everything. But when it comes to like a regular phone call and I mm. also have phone anxiety on top of that, it is super hard for me to do phone calls these days. So yeah. that's really frustrating. But if I were still able to do that, yes, that would be much better. But I've gotten pretty good at determining things over text. But like you said, it still can be very difficult. And I wish there was some sort of like alternative. Like I can't do a Zoom call with everybody. It's just it takes a lot of setup and takes a lot of time. So eh, just kind of have to deal with it. I I, I relate on the the phone anxiety. So, So many times where I've put off phone calls for like weeks and months and like really important ones as well. Yeah. I'm like, can I just email you or something? Is there like a, <laughs> I can't do a phone call right now. No, no. So, um, you know, one, one of the reasons, you know, why I asked you to, to come on was obviously to talk about sort of your experience, um, and your knowledge around asexuality. But I really want to know is, uh, what I really want to know is, um, about your, your experiences being asexual. And I think the last time we had a little pre-chat, we talked about uh, your marriage and the fact that you are you're married to another asexual person. Mm. So I, I guess what I want to know is what was the the dating process like for you? Do you, did you get a lot of people who were really just not understanding the message? You know, and, and what what does your relationship look like now? Is it you know? Tell me yeah, about it. we our most common question by far is how did you even meet? Because like meeting an asexual person is already hard enough. And yeah. people ask me for dating advice all the time. And I say, well, I can't really tell you because it happened by total accident. And so Coldplay is one of my special interests. And then I made like a Tumblr account of them and i started making these really i thought stupid memes but turns out a lot of people really liked them and to the point where one of my fellow cold players that i met through tumblr was like you know you got to join instagram because i'm like because there's a community on there too and i said i'm not really sure about that like it's already hard enough managing the tumblr account (laughs) so she's like no watch this and she took one of my edits posted it to her account and sure enough it was like the most liked picture on her account I was like, okay, fine. (laughs) So I started doing it on Instagram as well. And turns out my husband was one of my first followers. And Uh I didn't know about it at all, though. He didn't make himself known to me until like one or two years later. But he found my Instagram account. 
found out I had a channel where I did Coldplay covers. And then he found out about my personal Instagram account, which I still have, of course, where all my modeling pictures are. He's like, oh my gosh, I think I'm in love. And then two years later, he sent me like the longest paragraph I've ever gotten. And I don't remember what exactly it said, but it mentioned like how he really liked my account and what he really enjoyed what I did. And it brought so much happiness to him. And then from there, it kind of started a friendship because he also had a Coldplay account and I kind of followed it for Coldplay content, obviously, Mm -hmm. because in my mind, I knew that he liked me, but I was like, he's just another fanboy. Like, I'm not gonna, you know, do anything about it. But then the more that I followed him, the more that I realized we had a lot in common and it kind of blossomed naturally from this friendship that we had for the next two years into him also finding out that he was ace because of one of the YouTube videos that I made about it. And I'm like, are you mm. sure about that? Cause you, you think that, you know, this would be like a catfish or like someone's lying. Yeah. To you. And you, but, you, you must have a lot going through your head. Like, are they yeah, just like, saying <laughs> this because they, they have us, they think they've got a sliver of a chance of, of having a, a sexual relationship. Exactly. And so I thought like, this guy is not serious. I don't really know. But then again, I thought, well, if you were catfishing for two years, that's dedication. (laughs) I don't think anyone has that patience. Oh my God. So the longest game ever. (laughs) Yeah. So he then ended up sending me like a recording because he used to do that. He would send me like an audio file of him, like talking about his life and like his family. And he talked about how he came out to his parents. And so I thought, okay, yeah, no, he's actually being serious. And then we started dating because he was in Los Angeles. And then I'm here in Seattle, which is in Washington state, two states up from California. And he, we started a long distance relationship. We hadn't even met each other in person. We didn't actually meet in person until seven months later when he came up here. And turns out we, our communication was much better in person than it was through text. And that surprised both of us. And a month after we met, he was back down in California, got super depressed. He's like, I can't take this anymore. And so he dropped everything, his job, his family, and he moved here to make our relationship work. And the rest is history. Yeah, I mean, he I'm forever thankful for how much he sacrificed to make everything work because he is literally my soulmate. I don't know what I did to deserve him, but he is just the best thing. And our relationship is just natural it came from a friendship and it, it's literally something out of a movie and yeah, i don't know yeah. if you know who brad paisley is he's a country singer here and brad his Paisley's. story is very similar to where he saw his wife who's an actress in like a movie he went to a movie theater and saw the movie and fell in love with her and now they're married and have two kids and they've been married for i think almost 20 years now so our story is very similar to theirs and we both mm-hmm. enjoy Brad Paisley and his music too. So it's like we have everything in common from asexuality to like down to the type of dog breed <laughs> that we want for a future house. So it's it's just been an absolute blessing for sure. Yeah. Well, um, I guess like, I'm. are you okay with me asking questions about it? I'm like, you're open very book. welcome. You're very welcome to just say no. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm not sure about whether you've you've told your parents or anything, but you know, what it, what is it like to kind of introduce yourself to the family as an asexual couple, or is it something that you kind of kept keep under the surface? Yeah, everyone in my family knows that I'm asexual, and even if they didn't, they know I have a public platform where I openly talk about it, so they would have <laughs> found out about it anyway. And we also make it pretty obvious. This is our bedroom, yeah. and that's the ace flag for those of you that don't know. So both of us are, well, I'm obviously more openly about it than he is because, sure. you know, this is my public platform. He doesn't have an Instagram anymore, unfortunately, and he also doesn't have any social medias. So he's pretty, he, he's a bright, very private person regardless, but his family does know that we're an asexual couple. And obviously everyone has been nothing but supportive about it. Um, it's just more so I think we get more confusion about it than anything else. They're like, well, how does this relationship work? Since like you guys aren't, you know, but then I I explain as well, like there's so many laws in place around actual marriage that, you know, talk about, you know, sexual intimacy as being, you know, you know, if you don't get, I think there was a law, isn't it? Where if you don't have sex with your partner within a certain time after getting married, then, they can file for divorce or something. Is it like, 
Yeah, I'm not sure if we have that law in the States, because I haven't heard of it, but I know that it kind of reminds me of, uh, obviously, both my husband and I are Christian. I'm openly about that. And there's something in the Bible that says, oh, well, you have to meet the needs of your partner and vice versa. And I'm like, Mm. well, if your partner doesn't have any needs, (laughs) then you're kind of meeting them already. So it's kind of like a gray area that no one really knows about, but you have some I some Christian people have come up to us and been like, well, you're supposed to, you know, have sex in your marriage. And I'm like, well, it doesn't really say that you actually have to. It's kind of like, you know, there's a lot of things around it. But thankfully, my pastor who actually married us was very supportive of it as well. He was, right. again, more confused about it. But he was like, yeah. well, we can just skip the whole like we had to go through marriage counseling and or not counseling, but like premarital counseling He's like, well, we can just skip the whole chapter about intercourse then, because like that's easy. And he just tossed it to the side. <laughs> it was amazing to say the least. I was very happy that he was so accepting of it. That's really great to hear. Mm-hmm. I mean, f- for me, it's it's just kind of a, a question of intrigue. And again, you're you're welcome to say to say no. But for you, what what classes as sexual activity? Like, do you think that like, is it, do you, do you not like kiss or do you not hug, want to hug or cuddle or, um, you know, what, what kind of, what kind of things are the things that you, you don't want and you stay away from and which parts of, I guess, the romance do you keep in? That's a really good question. And it is going to vary between each asexual couple that you meet sure. as well. And for us, basically it's everything except sex. So okay. we, I think the furthest we go is like, my husband gives me massages, but he doesn't mm-hmm. like them himself. So he'll just like massage my shoulders or like around like up here, mostly my back and my shoulders. But honestly, we, we still kiss, we still cuddle, we still, I mean, yeah, we're just like any other romantic couple just without one little thing. Sure. That's really interesting. Uh- one, always wanted to ask ask uh, someone an asexual person about that because you know for, for me like I went for like a long period of my life because you know one of the side effects of being on antidepressants and I, I've been on antidepressants for pretty much all of my life like sexual dysfunction is quite a big part of that and I remember in Thailand I kind of I kind of go through uh, periods of time where I just don't want anything like from mm-hmm. from other people and it was it was a long time before now I was I was in a relationship at the time but I didn't I didn't really feel like the connection that I perhaps might have with my my current partner so I I, I really felt like I, I didn't want to mm-hmm. for a long time and I, I kind of went through it up up and down over the course of about a year just trying to to figure out exactly what I was and I, I came across demisexuality which was like okay that, that makes sense to me mm. and it's it is it's a weird one isn't it because it's not necessarily that you have no sex drive because you could have a high sex drive but you could also not want to engage with another person in in my intimacy yeah and i don't think we talked about the definition of demisexuality yet so for those that don't know demisexuality is you don't experience sexual attraction to a person unless you form some sort of romantic or emotional bond with that person yeah so yeah you still experience sexual attraction but there needs to be some sort of build up to that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and then it's um it was it was it was it took me a long time to kind of nail down the the idea of demisexuality because I, I know there's there's a lot of stigma I, about asexuality in general but you know whenever I've come out and told people about my experiences being demisexual everyone has just told me that oh it's just like being a normal person like yeah. well, I hear it's, that all it's the kind time. of not because may, may, maybe like a hundred years ago maybe it was sort of like that maybe to some degree but nowadays you know with the advent of hookup culture and all these dating apps and stuff 
it's actually an anomaly for you not to want to have sex with anyone that you find physically attractive. Mm-hmm. And I, I always, I, I found like throughout my life, especially around, it was around around male friends and around, you know, like if it, it was at, if I was at like the club or something and, you know, a girl was looking at me and like, give me the eyes and all that. And my friends would be like, yeah, go over, go, to, go talk to her. I'm like, I can't hear anything. I can't talk to her. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you can't have a conversation. So what am I going to do? I mean, just going to mm-hmm. like go up and smush my face against us or like, it just, it never felt, felt to me at all pleasant, mm. that whole scenario. And I, I'd always get picked up on it. And you know, for a lot, for a large period of my life, actually, um, a lot of people, you know, were saying that I was gay because I just didn't didn't do that. Or like, if a, well, a, a woman came up to me and propositioned me, and I said, uh, <laughs> propositioned. <laughs> a woman came up to me and propositioned. I said no. Mm-hmm. They'd say, "Oh, okay. Are you gay?" I'm like, no, I'm not gay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just, and I, 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 after a while, I just kind of got comfortable just saying, I'm, I'm autistic. And they're yeah. like, oh, okay. Cause they don't know a lot about autism. So I just said that just to kind of get them off my back. But there's been a lot of cases like that. And I think people really get the wrong idea of it. Yeah. And that's actually why there's a lot more asexual women than men. Cause it's like, Again, there's that stigma that men are supposed to be like these, I guess, very muscular, big figures, and they are supposed to have the sex drive. Um, And that's another reason why my husband's not publicly out is because he has been told by a couple people that, oh, you're gay. Like, no, he's he's married to me. He's not. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And yeah, it's just it's really unfortunate the the hate that asexual men tend to get, especially. For my husband, he's also a person of color. He happens to be of Mexican descent. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Mexican men are supposed to be these macho people that tend to get all the ladies. And he is not like that. And Mm -hmm. that's, um, again, another reason why there needs to be more male representation. And I do believe I forgot to mention that Todd from BoJack Horseman is also Hispanic. So some progress. That's very, yeah. It's it's not quite there yet. Mm. That's really interesting. Mm. So um, I know we, we talked a little bit about demisexuality, asexuality, and aromantic stuff. I know we, I have it listed as a question, but I think we've already sort of covered that. Is there any sort of stigmas or stereotypes that really uh, jump out to you when you, when you think about uh, asexuality, whether it's something that's common for the ace community or common for yourself? Um, what would those be? Yeah, I think definitely the biggest one, which we've kind of covered already, is the fact that asexuals are not supposedly supposed to be in relationships. Like, if you can't mm-hmm. have sex with someone, then a relationship won't work. Obviously, yeah. that is not true. You can have mm-hmm. a purely romantic relationship or even just a friendship. Some people are just okay with a queer platonic relationship or just a regular friendship. And it's really unfortunate that people think that they need to have sex with their partner to please them and to keep that relationship stable like that is not the main reason why you should be involved in a relationship i mean my husband and i's communication is our strong point it helped us through long distance it helped Mm us to now especially since i'm autistic he's neurotypical so we have to communicate all the time or we're not going to understand each other and so i think of all things that should be the main focus in a relationship and not sexual intercourse yeah i think it's um i listen to music while i record and uh there's a song that came on called sex money feelings die i was like it just distracted me because it was so (laughs) related to the topic very (laughs) appropriate indeed i will mention that's the funny thing about our relationship is that even though both of us are sex repulsed we'll still crack a sex joke or like inappropriate (laughs) joke and both of us will find it funny it's just so weird how that works and a lot of the ace people in our community are like that too they'll still find stuff like that funny but Mm -hmm. it's definitely interesting yeah i mean why why not Mm -hmm. it's it's, uh, it's a part of things 
I think you know the the biggest stigma that comes up a lot is is around people not thinking that it's real, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. that people are just kind of trying to use, you know, because we're we're in an age where people are more and more often kind of, you know, looking out for looking for different ways that you can live your life, and and how to express that to other people that you live your life in a certain way Mm -hmm. and you know people people seem to be really really adverse to the idea of asexuality and like especially demisexuality it just like i understand that there are some well it's, it's one of those things isn't it if it's like everybody says that everyone that you know sort of plays into these stigmas tend to say that you know if you had a high sex drive that you would you wouldn't be asexual and mm-hmm. that you need to do some work to improve your sex drive or things like that yep and i f- i find that very strange because sex drive isn't always like orientated towards a certain person like you can just you can just feel turned on for no reason sometimes, especially as, say as a man. Mm-hmm. And you know, I you know, there's been parts t- times in my life where I thought, you know, do I really want that kind of r- relationship with somebody, or do I just want to just take care of it myself? Like, do you think that that people sort of misconstrued the idea of having a a sex drive and and being asexual quite a lot. Yeah, they think that the lack or absence of sexual attraction means oh you don't have a libido, but of mm. course that's libido. Also, that's a bad yeah. word. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, but some people do, some people don't. I personally do not have one, and I know some pe- some these people who still do, or it's very low or it's very high, and it's just going to be different between each ace person. But mm-hmm. like you said, it's like why do people care though? Why do people like want to help you with your sex drive or want to help you <laughs> have more sex? It's like, can you just stay in your lane? Like, why does it matter so much to you? I appreciate the help, but I do not want it. Yeah, and it it it, it, make, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, the the whole thing about you know sex libido and sex drive being like a a main player in how you want to live. Like if you want to call yourself asexual because you don't want any sexual relations with people, then like, why do you have to justify that you don't want that? Like people, Mm -hmm. like people ask like, what's the point of having demisexuality and asexuality? Well, it's, it's there for a reason because if you go into a dating scenario, just a normal dating scenario, people are going to expect that you want to have some kind of intimacy. In mm-hmm. the relationship, and being able to say, "Hey, look, I'm I'm actually this. I'm looking for someone else who, you know, is is like this as well. Are you like that? Like, there's a lot of utility in that, and mm-hmm. I don't I don't see the I don't really see the argument that it's, you know, it does it doesn't need to exist to, for it to be a thing. Like, it doesn't matter if it's the absence of something. Mm-hmm. Like, if you if if I was to say, you know. You know, in a, in a circumstance, oh my God, my brain is having a right old time. You're uh, okay. While you do think of it, I do have something else to add, if that's okay. Go, f- go for it, go for it. Because it reminds me of people don't really know the difference between asexuality and celibacy as well. And as a person mm. who is religious, celibacy involves people who are, they still experience sexual attraction, but they are purposely waiting until marriage to have sex with someone with their partner with their supposedly their life partner and after they get married they still do it and then people were like well like you and your husband are christian so you're just waiting until marriage or like no even after marriage we're (laughs) we're not going to do it that's what asexuality is um it's not just we don't experience like we don't experience the attraction and we don't ever want to do it and that's not what celibacy is celibacy is simply Mm. waiting for the right person well i found my right person but we do not just, we don't want to go there. So I think that's what people get confused about is that asexuality is, is not celibacy. It, there definitely is a major difference between both of those things. 
Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, it's really interesting to hear about kind of the, the common sort of stigmas and misconceptions that people have. I guess, how do you think that we can we can change society's view on this? How can we shift this perspective? I mean, it's just like the other LGBT plus identities, and it's the A, one of the A's in LGBTQIA, and we just have to let people know that this is normal. This isn't something that needs to be fixed. My mm. husband and I are proof that you don't need to have sex in your relationship for it to it's work. Such a, it's such a small part as it's well for a lot part. of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, for us, it's, it's basically nothing. We have one less thing to worry about in our relationships. So I just wish people would understand that it's not the most important thing in a relationship or it doesn't have to be, I should say. And that is just, I've also lost my train of thought too. (laughs) But really at the end of the day, I just hope people understand that sex is not the most important thing in or it doesn't have to be the most important thing in any relationship and that as long as you have great communication you both have the same life goals and that you both i guess understand each other or attempt to try and understand each other really that's all that's important as my husband and i are proof of that and we've been married for almost two years now we've had minimal issues in our marriage so there is hope for a lot of my fellow romantic aspects or any other aromantic, asexual, or wherever you identify on the aromantic and asexual spectrums, there is hope for you in finding a partner who is something that you're looking for. Somebody that you're looking for, I should say. Brilliant. And of course, um, you know, having having you out there, sort of I know you don't actively sort of seek out stuff around asexuality, but it's always good to have some kind of representation because, you know, for anybody who, you know, is sort of questioning themselves and like thinking, oh my God, like, is is it that I just have a low sex drive or do I actually just not want this? Like having someone that you know, either from someone that you follow online, anything, anything like that, it kind of gives you a, a way to, to sort of explore that. Whereas if you're, kind of sat there on your own you might be thinking oh what's wrong with me like why why can i not enjoy intimacy with my my partner as much as they do Mm -hmm. and i think it's really useful to have have figureheads like yourself who who really i guess normalize something that really should be just a normal part of being human yeah and thank you i really appreciate you having me on this podcast it's been really awesome getting to share my experience and getting to know you better too because there definitely needs to be more autistic ace representation as well definitely definitely well um yeah well thank you thank you for coming on yourself um we don't have any questions from instagram today because my my level of executive functioning at the moment as i said about the mental health uh it's not very good so i'm forgetting a lot of things uh but you're totally okay remembered one thing which is the song of the day to the <laughs> imaginary jingle that i haven't created <laughs> song of the day what is your song of the day pj well i chose a christian song called burn the ships by for king and country and i particularly love this song because it has a message of just not looking back on bad things that have happened in your life you just got to burn those ships leave your past behind and move forward and that's kind of how I feel about some of the things that have been said to me on this journey of being this asexual advocate because of course we talked about the hate and the stigma that a lot of aces get and you just got to push past them and you know do the best you can do and advocate for yourself brilliant no more I'm thinking it's it's a it's a Christian song Yes, it is. Yes. Which is funny because it doesn't sound like one, but it's by a Christian artist. and So therefore um, it's a Christian song. (laughs) Technically, yes, it is. It's playing on Christian radio and it was, I think, number one or somewhere on the top 10 for a long time because it was played for like months on end on my local Christian station. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it's a good one. Well, thank, thank you very much for that. I will put that down in the description well the playlist down in the description as usual you'll be able to see that if you are interested in listening to the playlist it's a compilation of all the different songs from different topics different people 
um, all sort of compiled into one nice little playlist. Um, and I will definitely be listening to Burn the Ships after we finish our chat. So I really hope you have enjoyed this episode today. I have really enjoyed speaking to you, PJ. It's always, you know, I think every conversation that we've had together, everything that we've worked on at the moment, you know, we seem to to jam quite well together. <laughs> yes, I agree. Thank you, Thomas, for having me again. It's been a pleasure getting to chat with you. Sure. Thank you. And if, of course, if you listen to this and you want to find the podcast anywhere else, it's pretty much available on every single podcasting platform. And if you want to see the video version of our interview, you can head over to YouTube, which is under Thomas Henley, and there'll be the full version over on there. And of course, uh, I don't really ask this a lot on the podcast, but I probably should. If you are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anything like that, please, 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 please uh, give me a review. Preferably the five star variety. I would really appreciate that <laughs> because it's been going for a long time and I haven't really asked for them. And so we only have about 15 reviews as, as of now. And it'd be really, really good to get that, that count up. So if you have enjoyed the episode, make sure to go and rate it. And of course, if you want to stay up to date with all the stuff that I do, uh, whether it's YouTube videos, whether it's uh, Instagram blogs, uh, like the one that me and PJ did on asexuality and modeling, or you want to get in contact with me for something related to training, public speaking for events, uh, modeling, of course, and any any type of interviews for, for podcasts, uh, radio, TV, all of that. You can find that at my website, thomashenley.co.uk, alongside my, my portfolio. And if you want to get in contact, my current email address as of recording this is aspergesgrowth at gmail.com. But as you know, I have changed my name to Thomas Henley, so that may change very, very soon. If it has changed, I'll probably amend it down in the description. So I think that's that's everything that I wanted to mention. Have you enjoyed your 40 Audio podcast experience, PJ? Oh, yes, of course. This has been amazing to talk about. I'm really glad. It's it's been incredibly valuable to have your your insight on something and and also sort of tie that into autism. Uh, I found it found it really interesting when you're talking about LGBT and and autism. So yeah, it's been absolutely great to speak to you and um thank you everybody likewise. out there. Hope you have a great day and I'll see you in another episode of the 40 Audio podcast. See you later guys. Bye everyone.